I want to welcome the man, the myth, the legend, James Gregory, to the Unimpressed podcast today. Very fortunate to be able to talk to him. He's been in the comedy game for a long, long time, and I'm unimpressed, James, that you hadn't done a show with us yet. All I need is an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> What's your world like these days with uh, the world changing as we see it? You mean show business wise, comedy wise? Yes, sir. What is what's going on with comedy? And have you you felt a little bit of a change due to the pandemic? And some of the places that are open now are open like at fifty percent capacity. I do theater, small theaters, and they're usually controlled by the city, the county, or the state. So some of those shut down completely, you know. And now there's some that are have reopened at fifty percent capacity. I've been doing shows sporadically the past several months but very infrequently. That's kind of how we've been because it seems like the rules change every week. You know, it's like we've had some shows that, you know, we've been sitting there a go, go, go. And then all of a sudden, you know, the capacity will change. And next thing I know, we have to move the date or cancel the shows. It is a little uh, different out there right now. And it's very frustrating, you know, and, in the cases like some of these shows that we've done, like just uh, several weeks ago, we were in the, at the Opera House. And it's a 500-seat venue, and we used to sell out these shows ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So what we did, since it was 50% capacity, we did a second show, like a matinee show in the afternoon. So we had two shows instead of one for the same number of people. What states are open with theaters? Because a lot of the theaters I have approached – they're reducing more capacity or they're closed, either or. So what states have you been to where they are functional? At the time, like some of them were closed down completely. It all this started this last March. My calendar was full. So from the first four months, it was completely closed. Everything was closed. Then if you started to reopen at 50% capacity, and then they would change their mind and then change the date again. You know, mm-hmm. like some of those dates that we had, we're now got them on the calendar. It's the third time we had to change the date. What's it like being 40 years in? You're what, over 40 years in? How long have you been doing comedy? Almost 40, 39 years. Yeah. And you still yeah. like, you look like a big star. You got the glasses on, you got the hat. I mean, <laughs> I can't see without these glasses. <laughs> Has the comedy game changed any? You don't talk about COVID-19, you just... No, I'm talking about this in general. What have you seen have over the years of being in comedy? How has the landscape changed? At what point? Well, the 1980s, were you involved in, back in the 80s? I got involved well, with comedy when I signed Darren Knight. I was, I, <laughs> I was in television. We created a business model by luck, and then we duplicated that business model several times. It's worked out so far. We know there was a comedy book, what we call the comedy boom in the 80s. Prior to 1982, the only place you could see stand-up comedy would have been in Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, New York, Cleveland. There was no such thing as comedy clubs in the Southeast or in the heartland around America. And the first comedy club uh, opened in 1982 in Atlanta, Georgia. The second year, 1983, there's a few clubs that opened up in South Carolina and Alabama. And then all of a sudden, there were comedy clubs in every state in the union. A lot of people may not know this, but at one point, mid to late 80s, nationwide, there was over 450 full-time comedy clubs in the United States. So, wow. And I like most comedians, I started my career as the MC, as the opening act. And I had a five-year period of time. 1984 through 88, where I did 48 to 50 weeks a year. They were about six cities in the state of South Carolina, five or six cities in the state of North Carolina, you know. And now, as time went on, some of those clubs kind of just, I guess, went away. Mm -hmm. There's still comedy clubs out there, but not as many as they used to be. I didn't know there were more back then. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. That's how come there was so much work, you know, as far as the comedy club business is concerned. The numbers dwindled. So I had to change a marketing strategy. So I started self-promoting at these theaters, you know, instead of a comedy club. Now, the point that I've been doing for the past 20 years, for example, I still do a few comedy clubs, the ones that I've been with for 35 years. It's funny you say that because that's what me and Darren did when we first started. But we didn't know what we were doing. I guess I rolled the dice and just started renting theaters and see if they would sell. And he sold them and I set them up. So I understand that that's that's somewhat of a gamble in today's time. 
But see, a lot of these, uh, and I don't want to sound like a like an old timer that, that I've been around too long. And a lot of people really don't realize how popular the comedy club business was in the 80s and 90s. The people who are big stars now, who have a sitcom, people like a Jay Leno, people like Jerry Seinfeld, people like Tim Allen, Roseanne, all those people. See, I crossed their paths when they were on the road too. When I first met Tim Allen, he was a feature act making 600 bucks a week. When I first met Dennis Miller, it was in Columbia, South Carolina, and I was the MC. Dennis Miller was the feature act, and Dave Coulier, who became a big star on that sitcom called Full House, uh -huh. he was a headliner. That's how popular the comedy club business was. All these people who went on to really make it big, they would not have had that opportunity if they had not spent all those years on the road. I did a whole week with Jay Leno when he came at the punchline in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was at a point when nobody really knew who Jay Leno was. What guys did you work with that had a weird setup? like a weird structure, something you had never seen before. I know some comedians keep notes. Darren keeps an outline. Was there any like pre-game deal that, that was odd to you or different with a comedian you met? Not really. I don't think so. All these places in these cities around the country, the club owner had like what we call a condo or an apartment. The comedians would stay there. You mm -hmm. know, uh, All the shows were Tuesday through Sunday. When I talk to some of the young comedians today, it is hard for them to really realize what we had to do to become successful and stay in the business because there's a lot of work. Because, see, all the comedy clubs were open Tuesday through Sunday. You do two shows on a Friday, three on Saturday. So we were doing nine shows a week. The first time I made my trips to Tulsa, Oklahoma, at Oklahoma City, for example. And that's where I first met Stephen Wright. But I was being paid 400 bucks a week. Did nine shows. And see, I had to take care of my own travel. It's a long way from Atlanta, Georgia, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So those of us who went through all that, you know, we did that believing that we had a great future in front of us. Because no one really wants to do it if they knew there's going to make 400 bucks a week the rest of their life because there's no money there. I mean, I definitely get it because I compare this when I talk about social media and eyeballs. You know, if you're coming out to be a comedian and they say, all right, and even in New York, where I just came from, they're like, all right, go do shows. So let's say a guy starts out and he's doing five shows his first week. And the first show he goes to, right, all the fans that come there have no idea who he is. He may pull three people out of that crowd. But I understand how hard of a grind it would be starting out pulling three or four people at a time that relate to who you are as a comedian. The comedy club and comedy was so popular that no matter what name was on the marquee, the clubs would be sold out anyway. Gotcha. That's how popular comedy was in 1982, 1983, 1984, 1985. A lot of people don't really believe this, but it's true. And we talked about this just recently. When the punchline opened in 1982, the capacity was 290 people. They did nine shows a week. Every show was completely sold out for the first two and a half years. Wow. No matter who was the headliner, it didn't matter. It was comedy. That's somewhat like your social media, but there were, there were live bodies today. Right. Here's the difference between now and then. I think for longevity, you got to have, there's so many places, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comedians that used to be, what I call used to be, they used to be comedians and now they're doing something else. Or they still do comedy sporadically because they have a regular job doing something else. To stay in the business in the comedy world, it takes a lot, a lot of work. I think the mistake a lot of guys make, especially some of the young guys, I learned this decades ago, the worst mistake you can have is trying to become a star. Now, we all want to be a star. We all try. We audition for The Tonight Show. We audition for The Letterman Show. We all want an HBO special. But all of us are not going to be selected for that. So you kind of have to build your brand. You build your own reputation. And I did it city by city. I may not be well known in Los Angeles, but I'm a big star in Charlotte, North Carolina. I used to go every six months and now I go, I do the theater now. I go once a year. In no way am I trying to uh, 
brag or anything like that at all. But I've been selling out my shows in Charlotte for 36 years. You see, that's the secret to success is to be in a business. Your business is still good. People know who you are. And then when you show up the next time, they'll show up also. And I know some comedians, and you probably do too, and I'm not going to name them because some of my friends of mine mm-hmm. who have actually been on the David Letterman show more than 40 times. Imagine that. And they're in very rough financial shape right now. They cannot sell a ticket. Nobody knows who they are. Stardom is what we all strive for. I wish I was a better star. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're pretty but big. The, but the foundation is you've got to stay in business, you know, and that can be done if you have a strong work ethic mm-hmm. and just realize that it's any other job. If, if you were a self employed electrician, for example, you would spend most of your day laying on the couch hoping the phone would ring. Yeah. If you were a self employed plumber, you would sleep to noon. And then when you woke up, Spend the rest of the day in a pair of cutoffs, in a pair of sneakers, smoking a joint, and hoping the phone would ring. <laughs> you would do that if you were yeah, praying and wishing. It's definitely yes, yeah, definitely work. I hundred percent agree. I believe a lot of people who are not in the business now is because of complacency and contentment. They get content with a certain amount of money, or they get very complacent, not a lot of hard work. Because there's a lot of comedians out there. And I think you have to analyze what does the word comedian mean? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are comedians, but are you a professional comedian? Are you a professional comedian? Is that your career? Is that your occupation? Can you make enough money doing comedy that you can pay for your mortgage, have a house, pay for your car, pay your bills, support a family, you know? then you're a professional comedian. If you have another job, and which is fine, a lot of people do, and do comedy just occasionally on the weekend, you're still funny. Yeah. And you're still a comedian, but you're not really a professional comedian. Uh, about a year ago, I, you know who Robert Klein is? I do. I do. Legendary comedian. Legendary mm-hmm. guy. You know, and he agrees with what Jay Leno said one time. There's only about 6,000 professional comedians in the United States. And that was their definition of a professional comedian, not stars necessarily, Mm -hmm. but this is what they do full time. Like if you you didn't spend much time in Los Angeles, Southern California. I have, I I lived out there, unfortunately for five years. Not it was, I I like LA. I made a a, a zillion trips to Los Angeles back and forth over the years. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's estimated that there's about 500 comedians in Los Angeles and they are, but there's not 500 professional comedians. Yeah. They're always hopping up on stage on over mic night, doing a guest set. They have another job during the day. And there used to be a comedy 10 years ago. There's no such thing as 500 professional comedians in the city of Los Angeles. There might be 500 funny people, Yeah, but not professional comedians. Do you think the ones who are very successful have a thing like their their makeup is different? They they kind of excel from the people who try and it's almost like a natural thing, natural storyteller or an angst to hear your voice for someone to hear your voice. You think the good ones have a little something special that's that you can't teach? Well, well there's all all styles of comedy that are very very successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether you're the, the story, I'm not a uh, a one-liner type guy, you know, set up mm-hmm. punch, set up punch. I'm more of a storyteller, but I do it in such a way where it's, even telling the story, it, you're laughing before you get to the punchline anyway. Then there are other comedians who are just bam, 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 and they're brilliant also. And then there are other comedians who maybe half of their act may be props or something. Those are great people also. Mm-hmm. So it's not the style that makes them last a long, long time. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think they really realize a lot of the guys don't what they're doing. In other words, the applause, for example, we all love applause. Yeah. But applause did not necessarily mean you're funny. Applause means they agree with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Laughter is the only measurement counts is how much they're laughing. 
Now, for example, you may see a politician, for example, on television making a speech, and the audience says, man, they get a lot of applause. They're not funny. The audience is just agreeing with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. We all want the applause. I love applause. But are they really laughing? Are you really funny? See, that's the bottom line. And I also believe that a lot of people, and they're not aware of this, but they really don't realize that when they're on stage and the audience is there, it may be fun for the comedian. And that's what he does every day of his life. But the person in the seat, the people who bought the ticket, see, is special for them. They're more special than we are. Yeah. They paid, as you said, two people, whether it's a guy and his girlfriend or a husband and wife. So they buy the tickets. And when they get there, they probably pay for some food, pay for a few drinks. And some of these people, they don't live across the street from the club. Some yeah. of these people travel 30, 45 minutes to get there. It's a big deal for those people. So we owe those people what they're paying for. Yeah. A good show. And you want to do that in such a way that when they leave, they're thinking, wow, man, that guy's funny. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's how you build what we call a draw. But when you go back six months later, a year later, they will remember you. And they'll come back again. I've always said that. And that's that's a very interesting thing to to talk about. I've always said, know who's paying, right? right? Do you think industry sometimes forgets who's paying? Well, it's been my experience that the really quality people, I think they're aware of it. That's a for-profit business. Mm-hmm. A club owner knows who is in the bills. I'll give you an example. And I've told comedians this before, and they just think, it's such a shocking statement, you know. A club owner, suppose he has the manager or the guy who is the kitchen manager. And he's been there for 10 or 12 years. You, no matter how popular you are, you show up for the weekend twice a year. Mm-hmm. Who's most important to you? The kitchen manager. Yeah. So he's there five or six days a week. He's been up for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. You should be very proud of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you, everybody has an ego. But as an artist, we're really not all that special in the total scheme of things. Okay. Not the industry. I have no complaints at all. I've been very fortunate. All of these years that I've been in the business, I still will not in the green room or anything else. I still will not criticize the club owners that I used to work with years ago, none at all. I've never been fired. You know, they gave me a place to work. It was my decision to move on and go do something else. I get sometimes uh, frustrated when people refer to a lot of comedians like, well, he's just a road act. Have you ever heard that expression? I have. People have said that about me. I look, I'm in good company. A road act that sells tickets. You can, you, can, you can call me a road act anytime you want to. Let me tell you yeah. the company I keep mm-hmm. as far as being in that category. Bruce Springsteen is a road act. Mm-hmm. Kenny Chesney is a road act. Mick Jagger is a road act. Those guys don't have sitcoms. They don't have a TV show. You never see them on late night television. They're not on Comedy Central. They're wealth. And a massive, massive wealth came from personal appearances. Yeah. City yeah. to city, state to state, from one civic center to some stadium, amphitheater. So if you want to call James Gregory a road act, mm-hmm. I appreciate the compliment. Dorfman uh, painted your picture on the building, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? But you know, you I, yeah, I think most of us, not just comedy, I think a lot of us, we're probably all guilty of this sometimes. We probably complain more than we should sometimes. Mm-hmm. I don't mention this on the radio or uh, on stage, but just with the four or five close friends that I know in the comedy business, imagine how fortunate we are to be in the business that we're in. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a very imagine it's a that very small you, you, community. You start off whether it was ten years ago or forty years ago, and you're thinking you probably chances are you're not going to make it. Mm-hmm. You're barely getting by. Nothing's happening, but you want to be a comedian. Mm-hmm. And then as the years go by, well, look around. We're still here. Yeah. Doing what we want to do, making a damn good living. Uh, a lot of us are financially secure, still doing what we wanted to do and what we planned to do 20, 30, 40 years ago. So to be blessed like that is a privilege. It's a privilege. Absolutely. You know, having this long career, what do you do outside of comedy? Do you have something that takes your mind away from comedy? I'm not just obsessed with 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I have an office in my home. I also have an office uh, downtown Roswell, which is a suburb where I live. The lady that runs my office, we're open for business, 9 a.m. to 6. She's been on my payroll for 27 years. Wow. The phone's always ringing. We have a mail order business. She takes mm-hmm. all the calls. As far as social media is concerned, mm-hmm. I'm almost ignorant of all those things, you know. But I have a huge following on Facebook. I have three quarters of a million followers on Facebook. And we get a lot of emails. And we get a lot of people on Facebook. And I make sure that all those people get an answer. I don't personally answer those. But I make sure that they get a reply on any question they ask. Has somebody ever documented your story? Like I did a documentary or a docu-series on your life. Oh, no, I don't know. I think somebody needs to do that. Well, no, I think for to have people do a documentary, they probably concentrate on people who are kind of what we call either a national or worldwide star, which is understandable, you know. Not to sound too businesslike, I tell everybody in the comedy business, if they ask for my advice, this, you should quit using the word fans too often. Like I have a, my fans, the fans, my fans. Uh-huh. Subconsciously, you should treat those people like they're customers. Mm-hmm. You know, you need customers. And you need repeat customers. Mm-hmm. You'll stay in business to the day you die. Mm-hmm. One thing, too, that is a mistake that a lot of comedians make. It's not a mistake. The greatest compliment anybody can get is when people in the same business respect you. We like to be respected by mm-hmm. our peers. you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that we all, we, we want that and we need that. But keep this in mind, though, that's not the most important thing. The main thing is the people in the seats. It makes me feel good if other comedians like what I'm doing. But quite frankly, I don't really give it any thought. I don't care whether they like it or not. The reason I said the documentary, you know, if you did something on your life and you did it the right way, I think it could be something like an education for the comedy world, you know, because you're putting a lot of good information out there that I think people need to hear, especially comedians, comedians coming up, young people. I don't know if there's anything out there like that, well, like a real story that's educational. That's a good point, maybe they don't. And sometimes I have a tendency to talk too much about the business. <laughs> no, that's great. It's great. Even, even, even the friends that are real close to me, sometimes I'll be going on and on and on about the business. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just tell myself, look, I, I can't control myself. <laughs> Once I start talking about the comedy business, I can't, I can't shut up. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm bored if I'm spending time with other comedians, if they're always doing the act. I don't want to hear the act. Yeah. I love being around funny people, but just being funny naturally mm-hmm. and talking about the business and things like that, you know. So there's uh, some of the best people I've ever known in my life. But I met those people in the comedy world. There's a lot of great people in the comedy business. Yeah, there is. A lot of great people out there. I don't mean household names. I mean, just a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talent out there. My frustration sometimes is to be around someone and I know that they're funny. 
I know they got talent. I know they're in good health. And they're wasting all that time. They're just mm-hmm. wasting time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, even if they're not dear friends, I just feel like sometimes I'm kicking them in the ass. Do you realize what opportunity you're missing? Yeah. You're a young man. You look good. You got talent. You got ability. But you are one lazy son of a bitch. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh... You got you got to work on your craft. I mean, one hundred and ten percent. And I don't know if it's a insecure thing. The ones that do that, it's almost like sometimes the comedy's too easy for them, and they and they kind of run from it away. How would you fix something like that? I think it's because they've always had a what I call a safety net. Like in other words, they don't have to work too hard because if they get in trouble financially, their girlfriend or their wife <laughs> will help them, or they yeah. can borrow some money from a their dad or, mm-hmm. you know, everybody these days, you know, have an iPad, they got an iPhone, anything's on my iPhone. Go to any supermarket, whether it's Kroger, whether it's Publix, and you go shopping because you've got to buy some groceries. you got to get food in the cabinet. Mm-hmm. And when you get to the checkout line, have your iPhone there and let that cashier know that you're a big star you better let them show, show her. And she'll smile. But I'm telling you right now, she still will not let you get out of that aisle without paying for those groceries. Yeah. you got to pay for those groceries. Now, I know that that's not necessarily to make you feel good. But keep that in mind every day as you're trying to advance your comedy career. Sure, you want to be funny. I know comedians, believe it or not, still spend all this time writing new material. And that's great. I'm kind of envious of that because I'm not a great writer myself. But if you're not getting booked and you're not working, you should be doing something besides writing new material. Mm -hmm. You should be updating your website. You should be contacting someone. Call some people, you know, do something that gets you on that stage. Everything starts on the stage. You've got to get booked. You've got to be at some venue, some comedy club. It's great to sit around with our peers and talk about how funny we are. And I just got this new bit. Because that's a good conversation. I love being around comedians, by the way. I love it. <laughs> you know, because see, that's fun. It's fun when you talk that way. Yeah. The part that's not fun is the business end. you got to do the work. Yeah. And once you do the work, and then you can afford to have all the fun you'll ever need. Mm-hmm. you got to make a living. you got to stay in business. You can take any comedian out there today, the ones that are household names, for example. It's legendary about Jerry Seinfeld, about his work ethic, you know, about what he does, what he does every day, how many hours he puts in. There's a legendary story about, remember George Carlin? I do, yep. Oh, God, one of the all-time greats. Mm -hmm. He had a, a clock, like, you know who you... Go to a factory where you punch in and punch out. You yep. know what I'm about? Yeah. He had one in his office at home. He'd punch in wow. at 9 a.m. He'd punch out for lunch, punch back in, then punch out at the end of the day. He'd do that for three days a week. Mm-hmm. See? And he would use that time to write his next show. He had to treat it like he was an employee. And the week that I had... With Stephen Wright, I was so impressed with him because I get up kind of early, earlier than most entertainers do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because most of the guys in the condo, I get up early and they'd be up to afternoon. So no matter how early I got up, Stephen Wright would already be up. And so at that time, remember he made that big, big splash on the Tonight Show. Remember in 1982. I have, I think I have that clip. 
I had that clip yeah. in uh, Darren's documentary I did. Yeah, and, and he did that so well that when he came back a week later, it was a week later. But anyway, but he chose not to go to a hotel. He wanted to spend the week at the condo with the other two comedians, and I was one of those two comedians. Now, remember, this is back in the mid-'80s. All this modern technology was around. There's no cell phones. There's no internet, anything like that. So no matter how old I got up and walked into the living room, he would be sitting in the living room on the floor. And what I call the Indian, like, like Indian yeah, style. Indian you know? style, yeah. And he had this cassette player, the old cassettes. Mm -hmm. And what he had done, I found out what he was doing. He would tape all his shows at the com at the comedy club that night. The next morning, he'd get up, he put that cassette tape, okay? He sat there, he got the legal pad, got a pen, and he's listening to his act. He's writing stuff that he would hit stop, hit replay, listen to it again, write something down. And that was Stephen Wright. He'd already been on the Tonight Show twice. But there he was at 8 o'clock in the morning going over that whole show and making his notes and correcting stuff. That's a big lesson that people should learn. That was him taking care of business. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing. That's what you call a work ethic. It's a work ethic. You would be surprised whether you're in a comedy world or any other occupation. There is no replacement for hard work. If you can learn that hard work, it will not kill you. It will not hurt you. Hard work will make you extremely, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And I think in the comedy world, a lot of guys, they're missing that. They kind of miss that. I agree. It's like, hey, I'm funny. Look how funny I am. I got all this applause. Hey, hey, hey. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. You know, but you have to have that business side also. If you're in that stratosphere, if you are Jerry Seinfeld and you are Jay Leno and you are Ray Romano, and you are Chris Rock. We got to work that hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll pay you half a million bucks just to show up. All you got to do is show up because mm -hmm. you're that famous. But for the rest of us, we need that little extra kick in the ass. Yeah. So we need that kick in the ass, you know. And most people don't want to hurt your feelings. They will not kick in the ass. So you have to learn to kick your own ass. There's a lot of distractions too, wouldn't you say? Sometimes when, you know, in comedy clubs, whatever, if alcohol, whatever, I think you have to right. have some resistance against those things, don't you? But you almost have to pretend that, that you're not a comedian mm -hmm. once you get off the stage. Just pretend that you're an electrician and just pretend you're a plumber. Now you get off work. Would you stay at the workplace? and drink for two or three or four hours. If you work at the post office, for example, your shift is over. You punch out. Yeah. Most people, will, they'll be in their car in five minutes. They want to get away from work. So I know it's a very temptation, but if you can do that, I'm off work now. Mm -hmm. I got to get out of here. You'll stay out of trouble, and you'll save a lot of damn money, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, what I've always done over the years, the show is over. We go to the Waffle House, mm -hmm. go to the truck stop, and talk for hours. We talk to the sun come up. You know, I love that. But I've always been bored hanging around at the bar. What's your shoulders with? And I shake hands with people, and come on, I won't get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you I have to go home? What's your favorite place? Is there a place you always look forward to going to? You know, I'll tell you why that I don't answer that. But I have been so fortunate and so blessed to go to so many places and make a good living. And some of those places I still go to. I think I would be insulting some of those people if I selected one of those places that's my all-time favorite. At this point in my life, anywhere I go, I'm going somewhere 
but I'm looking forward to going. I don't have to go anywhere I don't want to go. So all these places that I go to, I really love it. I've been going to Birmingham every, it started off in Birmingham. Yeah. Every six months since June of 1983. I've been going to Zanies every six months since 1984. And I love those people. I love the club owners. Yeah. I love the staff. And most of all, I love the people who keep showing up to see the show. So it's just to pick out one, I think it's kind of insulting to other people because I just love all those places. In the course of my career, I've performed in 38 of the 50 cities. I've done a lot of shows like that, like in the 80s, especially early 90s. I made a lot of trips to Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. I've done some shows in San Diego. I've done a lot of shows in Chicago. I did a Made two trips to Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. Been through Canada twice. So basically, I've enjoyed all of them as far as seeing the country, meeting new people. But then as the years went on, and I got busier and busier, but all the places I went to was quite an experience. Does your set vary based on where you take? Is your is it like a rolling set or well, not, uh, what's the time? As I, I usually have one guy with me that does 20 minutes before I hit the stage. You know, back in the comedy club days, the glory days, the format was, it was always a three-man show. It was a opening, he's an MC, the feature, and the headliner. And I was the first guy ever that talked a club owner into making it be a two-man show. Okay. Let's, let's have a two-man show. Let's forget about the MC. Let's get a feature act so I can do, have more stage time. Ron D'Anzio, who owned the punchline, and he said, well, let me think about that. <laughs> so he thought about it. He said, well, let's try that and see what happens. So I started doing a two-man show instead of a three-man show. So to answer your question is, I'm always on stage because the first guy does 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm always on stage a minimum of an hour and 15 minutes. Just, just start your business. Create your business. Just count your blessings. A lot of us, sometimes, we just don't. We take things for granted, you know. We are among the luckiest people in the world. Imagine that, to be in, in the business that we're in, to be able to hit that stage, doing what you want to do. You're having a good time. The audience is having a good time. And on top of that, on top of that, you're making a good living. Absolutely. You know? Did you ever think when you were really young that you could, Buy a house, buy a car, go shopping based on the money you earned from show business. Sounds like a I dream, right? I never thought right? that would happen when I was young. So yeah. it's, it's a blessing. Well, sir, I appreciate you coming on the show. I could talk to you all day long. This is the, the man, the myth, legend, the famous comedian, James Gregory. Uh, and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. I appreciate it, sir, and we'll uh, we'll be in touch soon. And I appreciate I appreciate you. Glad to meet you, and I hope that we can talk again. Oh, absolutely.